So, uh, reviewing the new Defender is always going to be a contentious subject. Um, it's one of those things. There's 70 years of legacy for the series model and the Defender, uh, as we know it, and have known it for many years. Um, so the new model has a lot to live up to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fans of the new model often aren't very sympathetic to those who like the old model, which is really odd. Uh, and they do like to sort of slate you and verbally beat you up over it. Um, myself, I'm well versed with the older models, uh, various types, including Range Rovers. Um, so we'll just have at it, see where we get to with it. Uh, I'm going into this very open-minded, but, you know, I do have expectations that I expect this vehicle to live up to. So here we are with the new Defender 110. Um, we'll do a couple of first impressions um, of the interior. So I'm not the tallest of people in the world. Um, so I've got the seat quite far forward. A um, couple of things that sort of strike me straight away is that the passenger door mirror doesn't show much at all. Um, and adjusting it further just hides the actual glass behind the cowling. I'm not sure if you can adjust the whole unit to make that better. Uh, likewise, the, the front door mirror, I um, almost have to lean back to be able to use it, even having adjusted it. And my word, if you've got a blind spot um, all around here, it is a, a large area of a lot of stuff there. Um, other impressions, um, very undefender-like uh, is the windscreen rake and the distance you are from it. In fact, uh, even with the seat really far forward, I'm nowhere near being able to actually touch... Uh, at the bottom of the windscreen um, and also I seem to be absolutely miles away from the front of the vehicle um, it's quite bizarre I'm um, sitting here with such a long view from where I am to where I know the car ends um, you'd kind of expect there to be something like a v12 in there um, certainly not just a, a six-cylinder engine or or smaller um, quite bizarre uh, other obstructions I've noticed um, we just actually start her up so um gone is the dial for the train response in past models and we have this little uh, console here unfortunately again with where the seat is um if you now look you can no longer see those controls they are obscured by the gear stick uh, which is a bit of a shame um not quite sure what it looks like in a in a left-hand drive vehicle where the gear st stick is on the other side of the console there which would probably make the problem equally as bad a uh, bit of a shame um, probably the last of the the negatives I've got right now um, the steering wheel itself not the most comfy of steering wheels um, it's got these uh, bits of rough stitching here which is really quite strange because it doesn't have it lower down uh, it's just at the top there um, but uh, it's of course exactly where your fingers uh, end up being when you're driving uh, so it sort of gives you sore tips to your fingers um, Apart from that, I like the layout of the interior a lot. Um, I do like the, 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 the padding I don't know if it will show up in the video, but this is actually soft along the top of the door here Which means if you put your arm on the door um, It's quite comfy uh, We seem to have the same material along the top of the dash as well um, General layout looks pretty good. We've got some some quite nice little features. We've got a got a power outlet here and um, we've got a couple more power outlets here including USB-C uh, which is very nice we've got some nice sort of cubby and storage areas which I uh, already have some junk in um, something I would like to point out is uh, the grab handle for when you're getting into the rear um, that is is a nice design feature uh, and the cabin itself is quite airy light and bright um, although, as is the trend with uh, modern vehicles, uh, the waistline uh, of the window is very, very high. Uh, we'll see later on when we compare to some other older Land Rover products um, that actually, you know, the window line is much, much lower. Um, so, that's, that's where we are so far on the interior. Um, we'll go and see what it's like out on the road.
Right, so here we are in the uh, the new Land Rover Defender. Um, this is the 110. We're in a diesel version. Uh, as you can tell from the view of the GoPro, um, an extremely long bonnet and dashboard to look down. And we've got some some blind spot issues. So just pulling out of that junction there, um, the passenger side A pillar and. Uh, door mirror actually obscured the view terribly, probably the worst vehicle I've ever driven pulling out of that junction. Um, some other oddities I've noticed with the gearbox uh, and the drivetrain, um, even though it's an automatic, when you put it in drive or reverse, uh, it doesn't seem to want to crawl, uh, it seems to stay stationary uh, and it's once you do get it moving, it just lurches forward, um, which is uh, quite nasty. Uh, I didn't like that, trying to pull onto the driveway or reverse off. Uh, it seemed to make something that is a, a really easy everyday task um, somewhat of a chore. Uh, quite surprised at that. Um, I, I also have a bit of an issue with the gearbox in general. Um, it seems to be incredibly lazy uh, pulling away from standstill. Um, that. We'll try and demonstrate that in a bit. Um, it also seems to have a, a bit of a weird unwillingness to do anything. So on some low speed junctions, um, such as turning into a side road, pulling out from a T-junction, um, you sort of accelerate, but the vehicle does nothing. Uh, you push the pedal a little harder, still does nothing. And then suddenly, oh my word, all hell breaks loose and the thing lurches forward. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why Gearbox is a program like this. Uh, I won't single the Defender out as being the only instance where this is a bit odd. Um, but it does certainly seem to be a trait of this model, uh, which is a real shame. On the plus sides, I'd say the engine um, performance is wonderful. It goes really, really well. Um, I think it's also quiet and comfortable, um, so no complaints there at all. Oh, there you are, that was one of those lurches, did nothing, and then I wasn't sure we were going to actually stop in time for the roundabout. Um, doesn't seem to work any better in sports mode or normal mode there, um, it is just really, really odd. Certainly not a smooth driving experience um, from low speed anyhow. Uh, once rolling it seems to be a lot better and when it's in a gear it seems to perform very well. If I blip the throttle now, picks up speed lovely, absolutely no complaints whatsoever. Um, Unfortunately, you can't seem to access the flick wipe without turning the auto wipers off. Um, so you have to keep turning them on and off. Um, I'm not really sure the benefits of having auto wipers if you have to keep overriding it and then switching it back on again. Um, if the flick wipe worked and allowed the auto wipers to stay on, uh, that, that would be a, a much more helpful system. but there is a rattle coming from somewhere in the rear. Um, there's nothing on the rear seats and I can't see anything in the boot. Um, not entirely sure what's rattling. I um, don't think it's anything major, but it, it is a little bit of a shame. Uh, also, you may not get it on the camera, but if you do put your foot down and get up to about 4,000 RPM, there is a bit of a rattle from the dashboard as well. A um, little bit disappointing on a vehicle that only has 5,000 miles on it.
Okay, so come stand still and floor it. Nothing, nothing. Oh, and it's going now. I thought, like, what is that delay for there? However, once it does start to move, it moves incredibly well. Okay, so let's check this gearbox delay again. Slowing up, got a 90 degree turn here, go round, and we applied the throttle, and actually it was okay that time. So it's just really inconsistent on how this gearbox works. So in terms of general ride and handling, uh, I would have to say it rides superbly. Um, really does control the bumps nicely, then unintrusive. Um, there's no denying it does ride better than a live axle uh, Land Rover of any type. Um, I wouldn't say it's a night and day difference, um, but it is a comfortable vehicle to be in. In terms of handling, um, yes, it handles well. It goes around the corners, we've got minimal body roll. Um, we are a big vehicle, but as we weave around some of these bends here, we can see it's, it's taken it all in its stride quite well. Um, in terms of absolute performance, uh, the handling is very, very good. Um, but there is a problem with it. It feels like a large, boaty car, and does not feel like a 4x4. So you're kind of losing the enjoyment and fun factor of what a 4x4 is like to drive but you're not getting the same feeling and sensations you get um, in a car in terms of having you know a lower centre of gravity a lower roll centre um, and just a, a more controlled body I, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of it I know it's uh, following on from you know the Discovery 3 and the L322 um, with the independent suspension and the, the drive to be more car-like. Um, sorry, just to be pulled out from the junction again, uh, the gearbox did that weird lurching thing where it sort of did nothing and then um, suddenly we came out of the junction a lot quicker than intended. Um, kind of throws you off your stride a little bit. Um, yeah, it, I think if you want a 4x4 that feels like a car, this is a good compromise. If you want a 4x4 that actually feels and drives like a 4x4, this is vastly wrong for that. Uh, it's a totally different vehicle with a totally different sensation and driver appeal. So all our driving so far has been in the standard uh, D mode. Um, we'll put her across to Sport now. Um, we'll perhaps try a little bit of driving in Sport mode. Um, I can't say that having driven already in Sport that it actually improved anything uh, in terms of my complaints with the gearbox. Uh, it makes it a little bit more responsive uh, under some conditions, but it still seems completely dead at others. Uh, I don't understand it. I know 20 year old Four speed gearboxes that don't suffer with these problems that the modern ones do. Right, so what I'd like to do here is just demonstrate one of these odd features of these automatic gearboxes. Um, we're in drive sport mode 
I'm not going to hold the vehicle on the foot brake. Um, all I'm going to do is just go down hard on the accelerator as though you might be pulling out of a junction or on a roundabout. I'll give a countdown so that you know when I'm going foot flat to the floor and we'll see how long it takes for the vehicle to actually respond. Just wait for this vehicle to go past us first and have a clear road. So on three, I'll go foot flat to the floor. One, two, three. And now we're going. What is it with this delay? I'm just baffled by how these new gearboxes operate. Um,
doing it, in other words. Yeah, you couldn't accelerate anymore. Mm. I, I don't know how to fit it. Diesel, but I'm not sure which one. As expected, the new Defender was incredibly capable off-road. Um, sadly, the conditions were horrendously wet and slippery. Uh, a couple of days earlier was 30 degrees and bright sunshine. 
um, that's degrees Celsius for anybody in the US. Um, so we were a little bit traction limited. Um, unsurprisingly, it did lift wheels off the ground quite a lot. I'm not really sure of the cause of this. I don't know if it's um, the fact that the independent suspension just doesn't compress the same as a live axle, or if it's the amount of time that the cross-linked air system requires uh, for transferring the air from one side to the other. Um, but as you can see from the footage and the, uh, and the photos, uh, we ended up with wheels waving in the air quite a lot. Uh, surprisingly, uh, this translated to the new Defender being less comfortable on more severe terrain uh, than an older live axle vehicle. Um, but apart from that, it was capable. You just had to concentrate and work a little bit harder than perhaps something like a, a late model P38 Range Rover or a last of the line Puma Defender. Okay, so some more points about the interior. Um, even though these soft touch furnishings are nice, it does appear if you get a little bit of mud on them, uh, it unfortunately doesn't wipe off uh, all that easily. Um, moving over to the uh, terrain response control. Um, I know it's been a mainstay since the uh, Discovery 3's introduction. Um, it is a bit complex. Um, I, I think you really do need to understand how the system works. Uh, I need to have a good understanding of off-roading to know what settings you should be using and when. Um, which I, I think makes it far more complex and less intuitive uh, than just having a simple full drive mode and individual diff lockers. Um, you know, if you know what you're doing, yeah, maybe it's got some benefits. So it should be adjusting the throttle control. Um, I think you should have seen in one of my earlier videos, uh, off-road, even in rather, uh, mud and ruts mode, which seemed to be appropriate for the conditions. Uh, it was still killing the throttle when you got too much wheel spin. Um, not very helpful, it means you've got to sit and try and figure out different modes, but you know, if you're stuck, that's not very helpful. You kind of need to know this up front. Um, also, to actually access train response is quite a mission. I mean, you, you look down here and there's nothing really obvious. You can't even see what mode we're in. And actually you've got to push a button which lights up a dial, and then you get a small little display at the bottom, um, which, if you're not quick, disappears. Um, so you can flick through the different modes. Um, I say it's, it's it's all right, but you know I think the configurable one is probably the best one if you actually understand off-roading. Set it up how you want it. Um, but actually it's a lot of selections. You've got to come to a complete standstill. Um, you've got to push train response and you've got to go all the way across to the actual selection that you want. A um, bit likewise with the, with the low range, we've got a low button. Um, here's the suspension control. It used to be a nice big paddle in a Disco 3. Um, no longer the case here. It's a little bit obscured. You've got to kind of know where the controls are. Um, yeah, to put it in low, again, you know, if I'm doing this correctly, I'm selecting uh, neutral. Uh, now we are in low, um, there's no immediately obvious way to get back to high. Um, it seems to be actually in neutral with your foot on the brake if you push the low button again. It actually selects low range. Um, no, it doesn't, it's selected high range, but it was just a bit of a misleading. Um, one, I think it's because we're still in rock crawl, which it doesn't like, which seems to be switching between two different screens. Um, doesn't stay on the screen very well. You end up having to push the buttons, and yeah, it's it's just fiddly. You know, I think, you know, if, if you're off-road, um, especially if you're a bit stressed, if you're stuck, or the conditions aren't good, you don't want to be messing about with loads of little fiddly things. You know, a lever worked perfectly. <laughs> Um, have one for traction control, one for diff lock, um, and, and that would do. But there we are. So I just wanted to say something about the suspension on the Defender, because that is the biggest change uh, from the old model. Um, here we've got the cross-linked, all-independent air setup from Land Rover. It's been a staple 
um, since the introduction of the Discovery 3, what was that, 16 years ago. Um, I think, as you can see from these pictures, it does flex, it is good, but is it just a complex answer to doing what a live axle can do natively? Um, I'm not really sure the on-road benefits are worth it on a vehicle such as a Defender. 